Hello. Um, it is really quite, uh, quite an honor for me to be speaking about uh, Conway's Law with uh, Dr. Conway himself here in the audience. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Conway, for, uh, for attending here. Uh, since I don't speak at this conference very often, or and don't speak at conferences in general very often, I I'll briefly introduce myself. I've been working at Cisco in Jerusalem, Israel for the past 20 years as an architect. I design and deploy pay TV systems. And uh, I'm very, very interested in how people uh, collaborate and get together to join to create software. It's something that, that fascinates me. It's something that I like teaching about and, and reading about. I got these images from uh, Jim Kuplin's blog on Conway's Law. And, uh, and that's what brings me here, and that's why I'm interested in Conway's Law. Uh, I'd, I'd like to assume that by now everybody has heard of Conway's Law and knows about it to, to some extent, so I won't go it, into it in detail. So Conway's Law is a law that says that when the organization designs a system, the structure of the system will represent or will look like the, the communication structure of the organization. And one of the first things I noticed about Conway's Law is that it's funny. It's, it's quite funny. And when we hear the story of four teams getting together to develop a three-pass compiler and ending up with a four-pass compiler, we actually laugh at that. And we think that's funny. Yesterday in the, hall, in the audience, people chuckled at that. And there are quite a few cartoons around Conway's Law that describe all kinds of funny organizations. And uh, it's, it's, a source, it's a source of humor. And uh, the reason it's funny is because when you first hear about four teams working on a three-pass compiler and ending up with a four-pass compiler, you, you say, why should that be? Why would the structure of the team have anything to do with the structure of, of the product that we're working on? And then on second thought, you think to yourself, hey, that's actually, that's right. That's consistent with my experience. I've seen that happen before. And when you hear something that is surprising, and then a moment later you realize how true it is, that sometimes is called funny. That's one of the, that's one of the types of, uh, of funny. And Conway's law is not a law about systems or a law about uh, computers or about software. It's really a law about people. And uh, like many things about people, it's fascinating and occasionally, and occasionally funny. And it's not, it, even though it's articulated originally as a law about design, it's not really a law only about design. It was articulated in a time when the, the split between design and implementation was very, very sharp. And people assumed, maybe naively, that the transition from the design phase to the implementation phase is very deterministic and very straightforward. And all the heavy brain power goes into the design. But once you get the design done, the, the, it, deterministically you will go on to the implementation. Uh, maybe it was true then, but it's certainly not true now. And today, we, we design and implement, design and implement. The Agile talks a lot about that. So when we talk about today about Conway's Law, we're quite comfortable saying a th four teams that build a compiler or four teams that create a compiler. It doesn't have to be a law about, about design. Also, Conway's Law is, even though it's sometimes represented as a law about managerial structure or organizational structure, it's really a law about communication structure. And that's an important part of, uh, of Conway's law. Now, um, I shouldn't be speaking for him because he's right here. But uh, when, when Dr. Conway has been discussing Conway's law, he said something to the effect of, when, when articulating Conway's law, I wasn't setting out to find some deep human truth or some, some strong statement about the human condition. Probably wasn't even trying to be funny. I'm just a mathematician that noticed structural similarities, and I articulated them. That's all. But those, is that about it? And those structural similarities, I claim, are not accidental. They're deeply, they're inherent. They're, 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 they, they are that way, and they have to be that way, and there's probably no other way for them to be. So what I'd like to do today is to describe why I think Conway's law is and why Conway's law has to be true. And once we understand why Conway's law is true and why it has to be true, 
uh, maybe we could learn to live in a world governed by Conway's law. Maybe we could do something and, and survive, survive with it and, and maybe even do better. And I want to talk about four things today. Um, I want to talk about organizations and why we need organizations and what organizations are good for. I'm going to talk a bit about complexity, a word or two about models, and then I'll put it all together to, uh, to describe the implications on Conway's law. And if we're lucky enough, we'll even have time for questions or at least one question. So let's talk first about organizations. Why do we need organizations? In order to describe why we need organizations, let's go back to our very, very early roots. Humankind is, is quite capable of amazing things. We could do things that no other kind or no other being is able to, uh, is able to do. We know how to build highways and airplanes and airports and airlines. And when thinking about how is it that we are able to do these things that no other known being is able to do, it's not because we're faster or bigger or stronger or more adaptive to our environments or any of that, because none of that is true. We're not bigger or faster or, or more adaptive to our uh, environments. We have several gifts that make us unique. Of course, we have the gift of imagination, so we're able to imagine a world, not only a world that is, but a world that can be, that will be. And we have the gift of communication. And by communication, I don't only mean language compri comprised of nouns, verbs, and, and adjectives. That's important, too. But that's not the gift of communication that we have. We have the ability to imagine a model, to envision a model. And through our vision of that model, and through my power of communication, I'm able to make you envision that model. And now we have a shared model. And once we have a shared model, we're able to cooperate. We're able to organize ourselves. And instead of having a brain in two hands, I might have 100 brains in 200 hands, or 1,000 brains and 2,000 hands working together to solve a problem. And because of our social ability and our ability to use language to organize ourselves and to share vision, we are able to do amazing, amazing things. By way of example, a neuron on its own is not a very impressive cell. It's a little better than some other cells, but not by much. Um, even 100 billion neurons are just 100 billion neurons. It's, you can't do much with 100 billion neurons. But once you have 100 billion neurons properly wired and connected and synchronized and orchestrated, suddenly you have a brain. You have a brain that hosts a mind. You have a brain that's capable of imagination, of, of retrospection, of introspection, of, of all the amazing things that 100 billion neurons could do when properly wired. Now, I had this image in my head of 100 billion neurons comprising to make a brain that hosts a mind. And then through a sequence of biomechanical, bioelectrical, chemical uh, processes, my nerve endings and my muscle endings, my voice, my voice box, I was able to propagate some airwaves, and those airwaves came to your eardrum. They vibrated your eardrum in some pattern. And again, through a very, very complex series of, of uh, chemical, biological, electrical stimuli, neurons in your brains started firing. Now, you might think that that's now, now, you have an idea of a brain that joined to create a mind. And you might think that that's blindingly obvious. You might think it's deeply profound. But there's now a picture in my brain that is in your brain. And I did it there through, through articulation, through, through uh, the gift of, of language. And once we're organized enough, and once we're communicative enough, and once we have a shared model, we could talk about things like we. We, as an organization, are capable of learning. Learning, I mean, learning is, is the modeling of information to useful knowledge, which is a very human activity or a very brain activity. As an organization, we're capable of modeling a, a, a information into use, in, uh, remodeling information into some useful, applicable uh, knowledge. That's a very, very powerful thing. But in order to do that, we need to be organized. The power of the organization is not in its numbers, or not only in its numbers. The power of the organization is in its organization. That's why we call these things organizations, because that's where they get, that's where they get their power from. Uh, we're not a very big audience, but has anybody here ever tried to, um, to build a particle collider using a flash mob? 
No, I always get the same answer. I, I have never met anybody that was able to build a particle collider using a flash mob. Now, you might even, even if you get the right amount of people, in order to do something complicated or something complex, these people need to talk. And they talk on the backdrop of a shared culture. They talk to the backdrop of a shared organization, of shared structure. And it is our organization that gives us uh, the power to do, to do wonderful things. Now, there are certain limits on that, even though, even though it's our gifts that allow us to organize ourselves and to do amazing things, there are certain limitations on that. Uh, for instance, our social circle does not scale indefinitely. There's limits maybe called the Dunbar number, which is limited at 100 or 200 people, by which the amount of people that I could be socially intimate with is, is relatively low. So when I organize myself, organize ourselves, I can't create an organization of 100 million people or 100,000 people. We have to, we have to congel into, into teams or into units. And the amount of people lower than the, the Dunbar number, the amount of people that I could really communicate effectively with and share a clique and share a culture and share a real deep long-term joint understanding working on a problem and solving it is probably much, much lower. It's probably something like 10. So in order to organize ourselves, we have to break up into units of optimization, of units of high communication. Maybe we'll call those units teams or something. So that's why every organization that we find will in some sense have the word teams and will have teams which are highly optimized, highly localized units of communication. And these are people that they share the idea of the organization at large to which they belong, but they also share something much more, a, a higher vision, a higher communicated vision that is, that is local to the team. And the team is able to locally optimize in ways that maybe a big team can't can't optimize, or a big organization can optimize. And of course, they, there's overhead to having a big organization. We need lots and lots of management. You might find that when one person or two people coordinate themselves, they don't need to hire a manager. When you have 50 or 100,000 people trying to coordinate themselves, then suddenly you have an HR department and a project manager and managers of the project managers, and you have recruiting offices, and all these people are needed because the organization is, is, is energy, energy intensive. It takes time, it takes, it takes deliberation, it takes effort. And and we might find that in a big enough organization, maybe 40 or 50% of the organization is, is devoted to managing the organization. Maybe it doesn't have to be that way, maybe it can be optimized, but it is that way. So that's it about organizations. We do amazing things, we do things that are bigger than one person can do by the gift of communication, which allows us to cooperate, which allows us to organize, which allows us to create these big things. That's about organizations. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about complexity. Now, um, uh, I assume, is it reasonable to assume that everybody here has seen or heard about the Kinevin model to some extent? Um, okay, so I, I want to assume that everybody knows the Kinevin model. I'm going to go through it briefly and highlight the points of the Kinevin model that are relevant to this particular talk. Now, we know that all models are wrong. Some models are useful in, in a particular context. So, the Kinevin model is wrong. And the Kinevin model is wrong because, because it naively assumes four complexity groups, when in reality, there are lots and lots of complexity groups. How many complexity groups are there? Probably as many as there are problems, probably as many as there are domains, or close to it. On the other hand, the uh, Kinevin model is deeply, deeply useful in many, many contexts. And the reason it's so useful is it because it naively assumes that there are only four complexity groups. And because it naively assumes that there are only four complexity groups, I'm able to get my head around it. I'm able to say something intelligent about complexity. I'm able to, to, to have a conversation about complexity and not be lost in the details of too much complexity. So that's the Kinevin model. And Kinevin model, for the most part, focus, it's called the complexity model, so that gives us a hint that a lot of it is around the, uh, the complexity part of the, uh, of the world. Uh, the two important parts, that we need to discuss today are the complicated domain and the complex domain. The complicated domain are those areas where you have lots and lots of details, but their interactions are well known, well predicted, you, you know what, to, you'll always get the same result. Imagine a high school textbook, and in that high school textbook we like to assume that all the masses are point masses and well known, all the surfaces are either frictionless or with well known friction, including dynamic and static friction. All these springs are either zero elasticity or have a well-known hook constant. Gravity is exactly known. I might have a lot, a lot of details, but I'll expect every single student in the class to get the exact same number, 
every single time. And if they don't, he's wrong. And he gets a zero on the test. But I expect that everybody will get the same uh, result, and they'll get it every time they do it. And that is complicated. And complicated is sometimes called the domain of expertise. You get to solve complicated problems by learning them a lot. You study, you read your, you read your high school physics textbook, and you will know how to solve uh, the textbook problems. The complex systems and systems that involve human beings are often complex. They're nonlinear. They interact in weird ways. They interact in ways that are non-predictable. If you're lucky, then in hindsight, you'll be able to explain why did the system behave that way, but you'll never be able to predict, predict the behavior of the system. And a lot of systems that involve human beings are, are complex. I might not be able to predict traffic patterns or stock market patterns in advance, but if you watch the news the next morning, somebody will be happy to explain to me why the traffic or why the stock market or why the political world behaved the way it did. These are highly complex uh, systems. And human beings are complex, but not only human beings. Weather systems are also typically considered to be complex or maybe even chaotic. And complex is the domain of the experience. The only way to know a complex system, to know how to live within a complex system, is by living within a complex system and by interacting with it. It's by interacting with the real world. So if I go to a real engineer and I say, how long will it take the, 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 the block to slide down the slope if it's connected to a spring? He'll do some back of the napkin calculations, but then he'll tell me, I won't know until I try. I'll have to do it because there might be something that I, that I, that I didn't realize. And human beings, like I said, are rather, are rather complex. Um, if anybody here has had the joy of, of raising a teenager, so um, you cannot raise a teenager by, by reading a book on raising teenagers. It's, it, even if you read lots of books on raising teenagers. The only way to know how to raise a teenager is by raising a teenager. More specifically, the only way to know how to raise that teenager is by raising that teenager. Because teenagers are highly nonlinear. You do one thing and it's good. You do a little more of it and it's totally, totally different. And most worlds are comprised of complex and non-complex. So if I open up a recipe and the recipe says, you want to bake a cake for five people, you have to take a cup of flour, one egg, some water, some oil, some uh, uh, fermenting agent, and preheat your oven for 20 minutes, cook it at 150, degrees, at 150 degrees for one hour. So in a linear world, if I want to make a cake for 10 people, I would take two cups of flour, twice as much water, two eggs, twice as much sugar, twice as much fermenting agent, I would preheat my oven for 40 minutes, and I would cook it at 300 degrees for two hours. <laughs> and, and you would tell me, no, no, no. Not everything about baking is linear. Some, so how long should I cook it for? So the expert chef would tell you, that depends. It depends. It depends on the nature of the materials you're working with. It depends on the nature of the, of the cooking utensils and, and your stove. And the only way to know it is just to try it out. You try it out and then you'll know it or, or listen to somebody else that tried it out. Now, organizations. Organizations have certain complicated elements and they have certain complex elements. The complicated part of the organization is its org chart. Who reports to who, who gets a bonus from who, who, re, who has to respond to who, who answers to whom. But the soul of the organization is not in its org chart. The power of the organization is not in its org chart. The organization has other structures, real complex structures. And that is all the other things that happen in the organization. The, organi the, the communication, the trust, the, the, the flow of information, the flow of work that happens in the organization. That is highly complex. So if I work in a big organization and somebody comes to me and says, Avram, please tell me how to navigate the organization. I want to get something done. I want to understand the organization. I won't tell him, learn the org chart really well. Because once you learn the org chart really well, you will have known the organization. What will I tell him? And I hope you'll do the same if you work for large and complex organizations. I'll tell him, learn the org chart. But more importantly, start navigating the organization. See who you could trust. See who gives you good information. See who has your back and see who stabs your back. See who are the people that have power, who are the people that are authority, who are the people that you're able to establish a good chemistry with, who are the people that annoy you or that you annoy them. Once you start figuring that out, you could start navigating the organization. And I'll help you. There's gossip on the street, there are rumors, different people know different things, different people have different perspectives of the organization, but the really only way to know an organization is to start living within the organization. And just like we said that the power of the organization, the power, the ability of the, of the organization to do amazing stuff is not in its org chart. The ability, the power of the organization stems from its uh, um, unformal, it's communications, all the other thing that happens. So too, 
The complexity of the organization is not in its org chart. That's the easy part of the organization. The complexity of the organization is in all the other relationships and things that happen in the organization that are not, that are not org chart. Now, the org chart, this is really important. The org chart will either enable the communication or inhibit the communication, but it's not, it's not the uh, communication itself. So the org chart matters. I'm not saying ignore the org chart because all the magic is happening everywhere else. The skeleton of the organization matters. And when we change the org chart, we, will, um, we, are, we are trying to or we're facilitating or inhibiting communication along certain lines. But it's important to realize that it is not the org chart where it happens. The magic of the organization happens in the communication of the organization. So we spoke a bit about organizations and why we need them and where they get their power from. We spoke a bit about complexity and we understand the organization is or can be and often is if it's a non-trivial organization, has some complex elements to a more or to a lesser degree. I'd like quickly to talk about models. And uh, I'm using models in, in the widest sense of, of the word model. Model is some mental image of a thing. And there are three models that we deal with in our professional lives as whatever it is we do, software or system developers. We have the model or models of the domain, of the problem that we are solving. We have the model of the system, of how we are solving that problem. And we have the model of the organization, how are we organizing ourselves in order to apply the system to the domain? And all these models are highly dynamic, and they're highly dynamic along many uh, dimensions. Meaning, the domain that's comprised of domain object is not interesting. It's not a fun domain, nothing's happening there. The domain is interesting when it comes alive, when the objects start interacting with each other. The domain, if it's an interesting domain, probably evolves over time. That means by the time you have a good domain picture, it might be wrong and you might have to update your domain picture. That's the nature of real world things that they sometimes evolve and the power of the domain is in its, when it happens. Same thing about a system. You wanna get a feel for a system, it's not only in the classes or in the class diagram. The system is when the system happens, when you turn it on, when you run it, when, when you start interacting with the system and you look at it through sequence diagrams. And the system also evolves or deteriorates or gets improved over time. The system is a living thing. The artifacts which comprise the system, uh, which is either source code or documentation or whatever it is, they too change over time. And the system is a highly dynamic, um, a highly dynamic thing and the model has to model that. We have the organization. An organization is not an organization of any worth unless something is happening in that organization, unless people are talking to each other, unless information is flowing or work is getting done, or things are happening within the organization, then it's an interesting organization. Just the static org chart of who reports to who and who sits in what office or what country, that's not the real model of the organization. The model of the organization is in the dynamics of it. And just as a point, a model is not a model until it was communicated to somebody, even to myself. Just like a storyteller might tell you, a story is not a story until it was told. Just a story in somebody's head or in somebody's book is not really a story, it's just a book. So too, a model is not a model until, until two people have that model, or until, and the two people might even be myself, my, my present self and my past self, or my present self and my future self. But a model has to be a model where, where some, somebody communicates the model to, to, to somebody else. And some of these are quite complex, these models. The domain model might be simple, might be complex. The system model might be simple, might be complex. If there are people involved in the system, it's likely to be complex. And the organization model, chances are, if the organization is, is more than a very small size, the organization is gonna, be, is gonna have certain complexities to it, and the complexities evolve over time. And I'd like to argue that the only thing we ever talk about at the workplace, ever, 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 the only thing we talk about is one of these three models. Every memo, every email, every meeting, every conference we have, we're either talking about the domain or talking about the system that'll solve the problem of that domain or talking about how we will organize ourselves in order to apply that system to the domain. That's what we discuss at work. We don't discuss anything else, whether it's we're discussing the choice of tools or choice of methodology or how big the team has to be or calling in the domain expert and asking him a bunch of questions or calling in the system expert and asking him how come things aren't working. Whatever it is that we are doing, we're discussing one of these three things and nothing else. Almost.
there is something else that we discuss, an important thing. And the something else that we discuss is why. Why are we here today? Why are we organizing ourselves to apply a, um, a system to solve the organization? That's an important question. Are we doing it for the money, for the challenge, for the fun, for love of country, for the artistic value, to save the environment? And why we are here, it, it might change within the organization, and it might change from team to team, it might change from person to person, but our motivation is really, really important. First of all, it'll govern why we do things. So if I'm in it for the money, I'm only going to solve domains in which there is a financial reward in solving. And I will try to design a system that is financially rewarding to build. And I will try to organize my organization in a way that is financially effective in order to collect those war rewards of applying the uh, organization to the, si to the uh, domain, the system to the domain, and so forth and so on. The why is a real, really important why. And the why is what allows us to have a shared culture. And a shared culture is what allows us to have those, those conversations that, that are the, the, the platform on which all the other shared understanding happens. Communication always happens within a culture. Two strangers that meet and start talking, the first thing they have to do before they start talking and sharing ideas and sharing vision is they have to introduce themselves to each other and find the common ground of interest and find some, something to talk about. They, you, you, if you went to the modeling with strangers, then there's some minimal introduction that happens. We're trying to identify what it is that we're working on and the more complex the problem, the more important it is that those relationships be, uh, be long-term. Be long so that is about the models. So we saw, we saw um, until now we spoke about organizations, why we need organizations, and the power of the organization in, is in its communication. We spoke about complexity, and we said that the magic and the power of the organization and the complexity of the organization is not in its org chart, it's in the other communications that happen there. And we spoke about models, and we said, that these are complex models and that's what we are talking about. So what do we communicate about at work all the time? When we talk about the communication structure, what is the, the data that is flowing along that media called communication structure? What is flowing along the communication structure? Discussion about the three models, the domain, the system, or ourselves. How are we organizing ourselves? That's the only communication that flows along that structure called the communication structure. And now implications to Conway's law and how these things are related. So we have a system, and the system has a certain relationship with the domain, and that relationship is typically governed by, maybe by principles of um, domain-driven design. So I'm going to use my language of the domain and my understanding of the domain to affect the system. The system is also affected by Conway's law to some extent or another. That means the organization has whatever structure it is, and that structure is going to be reflected in the system, especially the communication structure will be reflected in the system. And there is a relationship between the domain and the organization. It might be a proactive relationship. I might organize myself around the domain, what was called here uh, reverse Conway, or I might do it proactively. That's another part of the relationship. Now. Uh, what I want to do is I'm going to be using some mathematical notation, and, uh, but I'm going to be use it, using it in a non-mathematical way. I'm going to be using it in a making a, a, quanti a qualitative argument, not a quantitative argument. And, and uh, I find that when I've presented this to mathematicians, they sometimes took offense at this use of uh, mathematical notation. So, and I also find that once you acknowledge that that's what you're doing, then the mathematicians sometimes are a little less offended because they just need to be told, yes, I know what I'm doing is wrong, and I'm doing it just for illustrative purposes. I'm doing it to make a qualitative argument. I'm not making a mathematical, uh, a mathematical argument. So that's what I'm about to do. And what I want to claim is I want to use CS to denote the complexity of the system. And the complexity might be the complicatedness of the system as well. So I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not use, I'm using complexity in the, in, the, um, in the loose sense of the word. Um, by the way, I, I'm sure that everybody here, before I use the terms, is familiar with inherent uh, complexity and accidental complexity. Inherent complexity are those complexities that have to be part of the domain that are there and uh, and accidental complexities are complexities that were added on for some reason that, that we don't understand and they should be removed and they shouldn't be there. That's called accidental complexity. Um, there is, when we talk about simplifying a system or simplifying a domain, we're usually talking about removing 
the accidental complexity. The domain is what the domain is. We can't make it simpler than it is, but I can remove the accidental complexity. So that's a comment about inherent and accidental complexity. And what I claim is the system will always be at least as complex as the domain. Rarely are we lucky enough to have an elegant, simple solution to a complex problem. If the problem is complex, the solution is complex. If the problem is complicated, the solution is complicated. Now, it only works one way. I can have a real super duper complicated or even complex hello world. I can do it. That's what refactoring is about. Refactoring acknowledges the fact that sometimes the solution is more complicated than the problem you're solving and you're trying to, and that's what we sometimes call accidental complexity and we're trying to remove it. But the other way around, I don't have an elegant two-line solution to stock market prediction or to behavior prediction. I don't. Complicated problems have complicated solutions. Complex problems have complex solutions. And Conway's law tells us that the system will be at least as complex as the organization. That means if I have a, comp if I have a simple organization, it might make a simple system. If I have a complex organization, it will make a complex system. And that is the tragedy of Conway's law, or the sadness of Conway's law. When I talk about four teams making a four-pass compiler, what's wrong with a four-pass compiler? Four-pass compilers are great. Why is anybody complaining about the four-pass compiler? Answer, because the design said that a three-pass compiler is enough. The design said that a three-pass compiler is, you, you didn't do a two-pass compiler because we wouldn't be able to solve our problem. We needed a three-pass compiler. The, the design said, but don't do a four-pass compiler because that's just unnecessary complicatedness or complexity. But I have four teams for whatever other reason. I end up with a four-pass compiler. There's nothing wrong with four-pass compilers other than that they are more complex. And the sadness of Conway's law is about the complexity. And then I come to the following equation, which says, that the complexity of the system is proportional to the complexity of the organization and the complexity of the domain. Meaning, if I have a real, real simple domain, real simple domain, the, organizational, the organization of the, the, the complexity of the organization might not matter that much. If I have a thousand people with a rotten communication structure and they're really, really complex and we're trying to write a hello world, we'll probably get the hello world done. But if I have, and, and, and vice versa, if I have a real stream simple, if I have a real streamlined simple organization, but we're trying to write the controller for a nuclear reactor, we'll probably end up with a complex uh, system because it, the, the domain is complex. However, when I have a real complex organization working on a real complex problem, oh boy, the system that I have is going to be super complex. It's going to be complex squared. It's going to really, really hurt. And the implication of that is the more complex your domain is, the more important it is to simplify your organization because the complications are compounded. They become worse. And uh, we, I might say this is a derivative of Conway's law that says any software created by organization will be at least as complex as the organization that created it. And that is the point. The point is not a point about structure. The structure is not the sadness of Conway's law. The point of Conway's law is the complexity of Conway's law. And all those jokes are jokes that try to illustrate complexity. And a complex organization will create complex systems. Worse yet, an overly complex organization will create overly complex systems. That is the point of Conway's law. It is a point about complexity and probably a point of accidental, about accidental complexity. So when we say, when Conway says, to the extent that an organization is not completely flexible in its communication structure, that organization will stamp out an image of itself in every design it produces. And what's wrong with that? Why is an image of itself bad? Maybe an image of itself is good. Answer, because the organization has complexities, and the complexities are inherent in the organization's structure. And when that organization starts designing things and doesn't keep on reorging and restructuring, those complexities seep into every single system that we, uh, that we design. And that is the pain point of uh, Conway's law. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, you have to understand complexity. So the bigger the organization is, the more important it is, understand complexity, understand accidental complexity, understand the price that accidental complexity takes of you. So if we're going to reorg ourselves and restructure ourselves, 
we have to understand that the pain of the reorg doesn't end as soon as we finish drawing the new org chart. Let's go home, we, under, we all understand the new org chart. We have to understand the complexities that we're introducing to the system. And the complexities are never in the org chart. The complexities are always in the other structures. And once you understand that, so if you owe somebody a promotion and you promise to give them a new team and you give them a new team, maybe that's a good thing to do. But understand that the price uh, that you pay in complexity and that complexity will be re reflected in your end product. That's one thing. Shared language. Talk about ubiquitous language. Language is able to improve the organization, improve the communication, excuse me. It's able to simplify the communication. The cognitive overload of translating from one language set or one vocabulary to another vocabulary can be crippling. Try as much as possible. That's what's going to allow flexibility in your communication structure. That is what's going to allow people to talk with each other a lot and have a shared language is to have a shared understanding, shared vocabulary. And fight accidental complexity wherever you see it. So if there's another governance or another procedure or another policy, maybe it serves a purpose, maybe it doesn't, but it makes the organization more complex, review it. And certainly do not fight Conway's law. Fighting Conway's law, I mean saying, we have a three-pass compiler. Actually, I have an example here. I'll show it. I'm going to show about not to fight Conway's law, but to flow with Conway's, flow with Conway's law. So let me show the example about not fighting, uh, not fighting Conway's law. So, and I'm going to take the example of the three-pass compiler. Now, the three-pass compiler is not really a complex problem. It's probably a complicated problem. And on the spectrum, it's, it's really Comfort, comfortable in the complicated area, but for illustrative purposes, it works, it works well enough. So I have, three, I have a three-pass compiler. I have a lexical analyzer, syntax analyzer, and semantic analyzer. I decided that that's a good way to build my compiler. I don't need any other components. And I assigned three teams to my compiler. This language, group A, its bounded context is the lexical analyzer. They speak lexical analysis. They understand lexical analysis. They understand lexical analyzer, and they talk about tokens and token trees and whatever it is that lexical analyzers need to talk about. They work well. And group B, group B, they, they're, the, they're the people that their language is syntax analyzer. They have the domain experts of the syntax analyzer. They know how to talk syntax analysis. And group C, the brown group, they know how to do semantic analysis, and they're building the semantic analyzer, and everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. Now, there are, of course, some cross-cutting communication, and they're very important. Maybe there's interface issues, memory issues, uh, um, error handling issues. When I add a new language element, so the new language element has a, a lex and a syntax and a semantics, and I have to enter them cross-cutting. But for the most part, this is my organizational structure. One day, we decided to break group B1 into B2. Why? Maybe we decided to develop in a different country. Maybe we decided that somebody deserves a promotion. Maybe the team was getting big, too big for some reason. We broke it. And we told them, we said, beware of Conway's law. So whenever you want to change something, have a proper API. We have discipline and rigor and review and all kinds of other stuff to make sure you must not break the, 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 uh, lex the syntax analyzer that you're working on. You must keep the syntax analyzer um, uh, working and working as one unit and one component. Don't let Conway's law come and surprise you. What's going to happen is, inevitably, the syntax analyzer is going to break. And where is it going to break? I don't know. It's going to break along some fault line. It will happen. It will break along some fault line. And, and then, this is what we call accidental complexity. This is what we call that there's going to be more, uh, this syntax analyzer, especially if it's broken in this way, is going to have, there's going to be communication overhead between the two parts of the syntax analyzer. These two teams are going to go on and do different things. My model is, is, is more complex than need be. So what can I do? Well, first of all, if we could improve communication, improve communication to the point that B1 and B2, even though managerially and structurally they are thinking as one team, as two teams, communication-wise, they are one team. Maybe they're in the same room, they have, a same, they have the same vocabulary, they have the same world understanding, maybe even a shared culture. If I could do that, then the managerial structure or the management structure will have less of an impact, and I'll be able to actually hold my syntax analyzer together. Because the team, we said that it's not really the, the management structure that matters here, it's the communication structure that matters here. And if I'm able to, to impose them at one team, I have a chance of winning. Another thing I might do if I can't do that is to have a deliberate split, a proactive split, and split it along a line, a clean line that is clean to me. That's a good thing to do. 
Not the best. I would much rather be, be left with a three-pass compiler. But if I can't, then second best is to have a four-pass compiler, but a four-pass or a four-stage compiler where I decide what the four stages are. And I proactively, and I'll divide it in a place where, uh, where there's a clean, uh, a clean division or a clean uh, split between the, uh, the parts. So we said, we learned about organizations. And we said the power of the organization is not from its structure. The power of the organization is from its communication. That happens in many, many ways. Likewise, the complexity of the structure happens along uh, the, the other informal ways. The complexity of the structure is not in its org chart. We talked about models. Models are complex, models are complicated, and models are the only information we have. That's the only thing we ever talk about other than the shared culture that we talk about a lot. And we said that because of that, the complexity, and Conway's law is a law about complexity, really. It's not a law about structure. The, or the sadness of Conway's law is in its complexity statement, not in its uh, structural statement. Um, because of that, the, the, organ the system that we develop will have complexities that come from the domain and will have complexities that come from the uh, organization. So the system is going to have complexities from two sources. There are two sources of complexity, and they augment each other. And that is what maps into accidental complexity in the, um, in the system that we are building. You have to learn and understand complexity. It's worthwhile reading Kenevin's book, and it's certainly worthwhile reading uh, Conway's uh, paper, How Committees Invent, from Datamation somewhere in 1968. They help you understand these structures. Talk a shared language. It's worth investing in. It is the most complexity reducing exercise you could do is, is to talk a shared language, shared vocabulary. It, it allows you to have a shared, a shared culture, a shared vision. When you once you understand complexity, you will recognize accidental complexity for what it is. You recognize accidental complexity, you could attempt uh, to reduce it. You can't reduce inherent complexity because it is what it is. And you do not fight Conway's law. Do not think that discipline or rigor or more or imposing structure will allow you to, uh, uh, to fight Conway's law. Of course, the most extreme example might be a military-like organization where they highly restrict communication along reporting paths, but they'll say, we have to have a lot of governance and a lot of APIs and make sure that everybody not talks to everybody. That would be good. But everybody conforms to everybody else, and everybody has the, the structure so that the structure is imposed. It probably uh, does not work. And uh, as a worst case, once you recognize that, you might consider doing uh, architecture to accommodate the organization rather than uh, just trying to impose a particular architecture. Uh, that is all I wanted to speak about today. Do I have a few moments for some questions? 10 minutes. OK. So if, if there are questions here, then I'd be very happy to take, a, uh, to take a question or a comment or something of any kind. Um, OK. I didn't come prepared. I'll, I'll, so first of all, microservices, you have to recognize when is microservices reducing complexity, and when is microservices just moving it around? And sometimes, the, so when you have microservices, each microservice might be highly, highly simple, but the ecosystem of all the microservices might be highly, highly complex. And then we, we, we talked yesterday about the thermodynamics of software. Um, part of thermodynamics is recognizing the boundaries of the system. So if you shift complexity to outside of the systems and make it somebody else's problem, it's still complexity. Self-organizing structures, I don't know enough about them. I know enough, I, that means flash mobs or open source. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. There's certain issues where they are able to address and able to solve. There's certain areas where they're not able to address and not able to solve. The advantage of a self-organizing structure is that it, it, it's, it's a natural structure. People talk to whom they want to talk, to whom they have a shared interest, to whom they have a shared culture. We don't have artificial organizational lines imposing structure. So the structure happens to be a natural structure, and that's, that's a good thing. People will, and I guess that would make for, for good, clean, reduced complexity of software. On the other hand, the lack of discipline might make um, work happen twice, might ha work happen out of, out of sync. A lot, a lot of work goes in, in the open source community into aligning things and to making sure that, that we don't do the same thing twice, and there are tools that help. So that's off the top of my head, good question. Uh, I don't have enough evidence to back this up firmly, but I, I sometimes feel that a lot of the conversations about product teams, scrum teams, feature teams, are, are very, very heavily emphasized on the structure, on the ritual, on the formal, formal structures. 
And we need a lot more conversation, and maybe that conversation is happening. We have to welcome the other conversations about the cross-cutting communication that's going to happen. And the, the organization has to be uh, well-communicated enough so that when we decide to divide into product teams, these people know each other. They have, a common sh they have a common understanding, a common vision, a common goal, and they're able to quickly gel into a communication structure. We can't take a bunch of people off the street and say, okay, you're the product team now. Go, go develop. They have to have some common background. And that answers the question, once we're going into highly flexible organizations that are always totally flexible in its communication structure, why do we need the organization? Let's just have a huge pool of mercenaries, and every time we need something, just take a bunch of people, put them together, and make them a team, because we're a totally flexible structure. And the answer is, is because we still need some, some gel, or some common vision, or some common understanding, or common work methods, or common tool use, or common language, in order for that very, very flexible organization to be able to be flexible. An infinitely flexible organization is not an organization, it's just a bunch of scattered, scattered individuals. So even a highly flexible organization needs, needs some structure, some glue to hold, it, to hold it together. Thank you. Thank you very much.